My name is uh, Hector. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, HTTP2. The uh, name of this talk is uh, HTTP2 Pipeline Bling. Hopefully, some people get this joke. Um, so, uh, so we're going to talk about HTTP2. Uh, the first thing, the first thing before we actually dive into HTTP2, that's supposed to be black. Nothing broke. Uh, is that you know when we're when, when you're about to like create a new thing that's supposed to fix something that already exists, it's a good idea to like understand why the thing that you're replacing is not good. Uh, so like, what are its weaknesses? Why don't people like it? Um, and so that's you know what the people that created HTTP2 attempted to do uh, before diving in. And that's a little bit of what I'm going to try to do here is just walk through some of the reasons why uh, people are looking to replace this protocol. Um, so HTTP uh, one. Um, there's actually HTTP 1.0 and HTTP 1.1. For the purposes of this presentation, we're just going to kind of bundle the two things together. Um, there's only a few examples of where uh, specifically addressing 1.1 makes a lot of sense. Um, but to try to address uh, some of the differences, I'm going to try to go into a little bit of a deeper level here. Um, this, this diagram just represents uh, OSI model. Uh, stands for the Open Systems Interconnection Model. Uh, a lot of people, you know, if you've read any like networking literature, you've probably been exposed to this before. If you had like a networking course in school or something, uh, you would have probably seen this before. Um, but the main reason, none of that stuff is really important. All we're trying to do here is just show like uh, show like a relative reference of like where other things exist in the stack relative to HTTP. So, in the presentation layer is kind of where we can tuck in things like HTML, right? And then HTTP is right beneath that along with TLS or SSL uh, in the session layer. And then if we go a little bit further down in the transport layers where things like TCP, UDP exists. Um, and so the, so, you know, the design or the reason why this diagram is useful is because it shows that like the, the, the networking stack, like the, the things above it kind of take advantage of the benefits of the thing underneath it's responsible for. And so, the success of something like HTTP, HTTP is, is, you know, definitely relates to how well it jives with something like TCP. If it jives really well, takes advantage of all the things it does and how it does it, then HTTP is going to be really successful. Um, and if it doesn't, then that's where some of the some pain points will exist. So, uh, to start off, we're just going to focus on TCP. Uh, and kind of just break down a connection to see what's happening uh, when you establish a TCP connection, which ultimately you're establishing when you're trying to establish an HTTP connection. So we have an initiator, a listener. Uh, first step, you know, we have a SYN, uh, SYNAC. SYN is just like shorthand for like synchronize. So we're asking this, uh, this listener to synchronize with me. The, the, the listener is then going to communicate back with me uh, and it's going to acknowledge that it's received that. So that's basically like the, the, the steps of a TCP handshake right there. And so the layer on top of that, if uh, you want to encrypt this connection, you have to use TLS. And so T the TLS protocol has its own phases here. Um, and so it's a back and forth. And then we finally get back to the beginning. And so what we can quickly see here is that just to establish a secure TCP connection, we have three round trips in a worst case scenario. Um, and so if we were trying to establish a TCP connection, we've already been doing three round trips before we even do anything at the HTTP layer. And that's why here it's like, now we can finally start the HTTP request. So now if we bump things up, we go back to the session layer, we try to focus on HTTP. We have a similar diagram. Uh, here we have client server. And so we issue a get, we want to just get slash, we want to get the root of a website. Uh, that might return index HTML and might return something else. But then, you know, that's a bunch of markup that's going to have references to other resources. And so once we get that back, now we know, okay, this page has CSS. I need to request the CSS as well. And so then I probably do something like that. And then when I get the CSS back, maybe there's like an image reference inside the CSS. And now I can ask for the logo. Uh, this is also kind of a worst case scenario. A lot of times, you know, these things. I mean, still, you, you definitely have to wait for the HTML payload before you can ask for other resources, but maybe these images are inline in the HTML. Uh, maybe they're not embedded in the CSS, and maybe you can get away with uh, doing some other optimizations there. But this is kind of a worst case. Um, and then here, we just ask for the logo, and we get it back. 
but we still have to like ask for all the other assets on this page. And so we've already gone through three round trips for the TCP connection SSL. We're going through a couple more round trips uh, just to get you know, started on asking for the resources. And then we have to get all the resources. Uh, a lot of this stuff gets uh, a little bit worse when you start talking about high latency connections. So like your mobile device, uh, slow internet connections. If any one of these uh, you know, interactions with the server takes a long amount of time, you have you know, these guys in red kind of just waiting uh, for, that, for that latency all the way to the server and then all the way back. And so uh, that's kind of a phenomenon on HTTP called uh, head of line blocking. Um, it's something that they try to address in the HTTP2 specification. We'll look into some details about how it does that. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's something that's painful, especially uh, when you're trying to optimize websites so that they function well on mobile devices. Um, a lot of times when I talk about this kind of stuff or when anybody talks about this kind of stuff, somebody in the room that you know, paid attention to HTTP 1.1 or maybe paid attention in their networking course uh, will say like, oh, there's a thing called pipelining in HTTP and uh, that you know, removes some of the, the things that were in the earlier diagrams, allows you to request multiple things. This is a diagram that tries to illustrate HTTP pipelining. And the idea is you can issue multiple requests, uh, presuming that you know that you need those things, uh, in one connection, and then you get them back. When they come back, they have, to be, they have to come back in the same order that you requested them, so they can't interleave each other, uh, which can suck if one of those takes a long time to generate. You won't be able to get to the last ones. Um, but it's a way to do this all over you know, one request versus doing multiple requests. The downside is, is that uh, all these browsers are grayed out because pipelining is disabled or doesn't exist in any of these browsers. Uh, for a period of time, it was like a hidden setting that you had to like, know how to get into the advanced menu and like, turn on. Uh, I checked before when I was writing this presentation and I couldn't find it in Chrome uh, and I couldn't find it in, in Firefox. So they've effectively just removed it. The reason why is because there's a, there's a lot of pain in kind of trying to make that particular functionality work on top of HTTP. And so it generally causes more problems than it solves. And so I guess eventually they've just decided to, to do away with, with actually using it. So to, to try to summarize, I guess, some of the stuff that's there, setting up a TCP connection is pretty expensive. Um, and so you know, it would probably be good to not have to do that multiple times. Um, HTTP doesn't really reuse uh, connections very well. Um, and it's also susceptible to head of line blocking in some, in some bad scenarios. Um, and then pipelining is not real. So, I mean, we can talk about it. We can point to like books that reference it, but it's not implemented in, in, in like servers and browsers. And so it's effectively not real. So uh, while we're on the topic of browsers, I'm gonna try to dig into some, some specifics around browsers. Uh, this is something that probably a lot of people are familiar with, uh, even if you're not doing web development, because you might just be you know, curious and troubleshoot uh, something that's wrong on your web page. Um, so this is a screenshot of the Chrome Inspector. A lot of this probably looks familiar. The one thing that might not look so familiar is that column called Connection ID. It's uh, hidden by default, but you can just like right click on that top menu and, and turn it on. And so Connection ID is, uh, is the browser is giving uh, an identifier to each HTTP connection that your browser is managing uh, for this particular website. So here, you know, a couple of numbers are repeated, but we see like a lot of numbers that aren't repeated, and so those represent different connections that your browsers make on your behalf. So here we're just on one website, but we have like five or six connections that are being made. Uh, another thing that if, if you kind of take a closer look, or you know, if you're trying to troubleshoot why things are taking long on your web page, uh, we see all these requests that are happening. Um, and then we can kind of see, it's, it's kind of uh, not super clear, but you can kind of see that that first box of six requests is staggered from the second box. So they're all happening really close, but you can see that after the sixth one, the rest of the six kind of jut inward a little bit. And that's because you know we're waiting for these connections to be complete so that we can reuse them for something else. Um, and more specifically, uh, browsers are basically kind of hard-coded to, uh, well, I, don't, not necessarily, I don't know for, for a fact that it's hard-coded, uh, it's roughly around six connections per origin. It, it varies, you know, based on a browser, but uh, your browser most likely is not going to be able to make more than six connections to a particular origin uh, per web page. And so an origin, so like a lot, of, a lot of times people will host like their JavaScript on like, uh, I don't know, like JSCDN or one of those websites that hosts, 
your external assets on a CDN. And so that would be a separate origin. Um, but any particular domain would be one origin. And so you won't be able to make more than you know, six requests to that origin. You'll have to like, they'll block. You'll have to wait for one of those connections to be done, and then you can reuse it. And that's, that's kind of what, uh, the meaning why there's like those six requests that uh, kind of wait for the next six requests to, to, to be finished. The next thing, the next kind of uh, you know, upper limit is that uh, for a given page, so a lot of times people will uh, intentionally create, uh, we'll, we'll see this technique a little bit later, but will intentionally create different origins uh, so they can get around that six connection limit. Um, the problem is, is that there's an upper bound on the number of connections regardless of origin uh, per page, and that's like roughly 17. It's another thing that kind of varies, uh, varies based on browser. And so when I first saw that, I was like, well, you know, 17 is a pretty high number. So as long as I'm like smart about my origins, I can probably make my page load pretty fast. Uh, but then there's this other really nice website called httparchive.org that actually does a lot of ongoing analysis on the Alexa top like 1,000, top 500, top 100. And so the average request per page in 2016 for the Alexa top 1,000 is around 124. And so when you start thinking about stuff like, uh, you know, like social plugins like on your page and like, uh, you know, the, the plugins that try to do outreach, like open up a little chat box, all the various places where your static assets are coming from, uh, that's kind of what, you know, all these connections uh, are coming from. And so that number is way higher than 17. And so if that's the reality of the situation, then that upper bound of 17 is going to become a problem. It's going to be a big reason why our pages are slow. So some of the, to summarize some of that, basically the browsers know that <clears throat> HTTP doesn't use TCP connections very well. And so what it tries to do is compensate for it by creating lots of connections and trying to intelligently re like ensure that HTTP gets reused across those connections that it's managing. And so it tries to like do things in parallel. It has these hard limits because if those hard limits weren't there, then everybody would just try to open as many connect connections as possible, and then you'd end up saturating your network connection for like you know dumb websites that everybody in your in your office is looking at. And so those constraints, uh, I'm sure they're driven by like data and analysis that have happened over time, um, and they seem to work okay because you know we're all interacting with websites. Um, so the next thing here is uh, just a series of hacks. Things that people have done to, you know, make some of these problems not be as visible, um, and generally they involve in reducing the re request count because, gen you know, the best the best way to make your website faster is just get rid of requests, like get rid of things that don't need to be there. So a um, this one is probably one that's it's definitely familiar for designers, but I'm sure others have uh, you know others have seen it as well. Is the, is the notion of CSS sprites. So this is one image, and they basically just put all these little icons that would otherwise be their own uh, HTTP connections. It's all in one image, and then they just strategically you know, move this around, uh, mask it in different areas of the website so that all you see is the icon that is supposed to be seen. Um, and so this is good because, or this is useful because now it's just one HTTP connection, not, you know, I don't know, like 20, 25, um, so that, that, makes, that makes that problem be a little bit nicer. The problem is, is that if you, know, you want to change one of these icons, uh, like say Google wants to change their logo, now you have to invalidate that image from everyone's cache and then push the entire thing down. Which is also not that bad, but it's kind of an annoying thing that you have to kind of maintain. Uh, this one is, is pretty interesting. Uh, I feel like this is probably one of the newer ones, um, but it's, it's, it's referred to as inlining. And so here, People are explicitly Base64 encoding assets and putting them as, as data URLs in their CSS. And so here we have uh, a, a, you know, an image that we're Base64 encoding and putting in the CSS directly. Um, the reason why this is, well, one of the reasons why it's not a great idea is because when you Base64 encode something, you automatically make it larger. And so if you have a file that's a certain size, it's definitely going to be larger as soon as you base64 encode it. And so the engineer that you know, put the snippet in the code is either a very good engineer that did some good analysis and decided 
you know, me base 64 encoding, like the trade-off of making this image bigger is better than making HTTP requests, or they're an extremely lazy engineer and just base 64 encode this image without knowing any of the consequences. But regardless, this is a thing that people do to, to get rid of HTTP requests. Um, this is something I kind of referred to earlier. It's a little bit harder to see, but this is GitHub's UI. And so, you know, when you log into GitHub, they give you that timeline. The timeline has a bunch of you know, people that are committing to different projects that you follow or whatever, and everybody has their avatar. And so one technique uh, referred to as sharding is uh, basically um, you have different domains. So here we have like avatar 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, whatever. And so they all kind of point to the same back end, but you can randomize the, the numbers or the, the, the domain name, and so they end up being different origins. And so now you can get to that 17 upper bound really quickly. You don't have to worry about that 16 or that uh, that six connection limit. And so you know, you'll see this a lot with with things like you know avatars. Uh, a lot of mapping applications will do this to like render tiles uh, on the map. Um, this is one of the ones that I hate the most because troubleshooting like anything that has to do with JavaScript and NPM is is generally painful. But the idea of you know basically doing a bunch of stuff to your static assets before you push them into production. So concatenation, so like taking a bunch of different CSS files or a bunch of different JavaScript files and mashing them together into one file. Minification, um, all these different things that we do before we deploy an application. So we'll develop not basically doing any of this stuff. And then we'll change the way that our static assets are formed to make them one request later in production. So we'll have just one built, that's probably a bug, uh, build.js, um, instead of having intro.js and project.js. Um, and so uh, summarize this is basically all of those hacks are things that HTTP2 tries to address. And so to kind of make the make having those hacks in place or the or you know necessitating those hacks kind of reducing that so that you don't really need to have them. So uh, and that's what we'll start uh, talking about HTTP2. Uh, this is RFC 7540. Uh, the only reason that I mentioned that, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons later on. You'll see there's it's actually a lot of information in there uh, that's, that's pretty useful in a lot of cases. But the main reason why I, I reference it there is because the, the next feature I'm going to talk about called HPAC is actually so involved that it has its own RFC. So it was introduced with HTTP2, uh, but it's 7541. And so there's enough going on with HPAC that it's a separate RFC. It's referenced in the HTTP2 RFC, but the two things you know, you know, go together. That's the thing that uh, runs in production. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the static header lookup table. This is actually in the RFC. Um, this is a static table that exists uh, in like backend and front-end implementations uh, of HTTP2. So like in your browser, in your Nginx, in your Apache. So they have a static table that has 61 entries. Um, and basically what they've done is they've created an index of, of common headers that exist uh, over HTTP requests. So uh, like you know, a get method uh, is number two. Uh, path with just a slash is number four. And so the RFC claims that they've done a lot of analysis on like large bodies of HTTP requests that come at these, these indices deciding on these 61 entries. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate on that stuff, like how do I know that what you use to create those, those tables is the same as what my traffic is? Is that going to overlap? Is it going to be inefficient? Whatever. Uh, I don't have any real great answers for that, but this is a thing that, that's in the RFC. Uh, there's also... Uh, so before I keep moving on, uh, so in that, in that scenario, like you're just passing the integer back and forth uh, of the index instead of trying to pass, uh, you know, all that text that that, that integer references. Um, the next thing here is uh, in RFC referred to as differential encoding, and so the idea is is so I do a request, so I'm doing a GET request on slash. Uh, the host is jobs.azv.com, a site that everyone here should go to. And then uh, the refer is www.zav.com. So that's where I came from to land on jobs. 
And so when I get on the jobs page, there's a logo there maybe, and I need to get that logo. The stuff that's grayed out is stuff that over that one connection, we're not transmitting that. We're only transmitting the difference uh, between those two requests. So we already saw host jobs.zavi.com. We already saw scheme HTTP. We already saw method get. That stuff just gets transmitted as integers. Uh, some of that stuff exists in that static lookup table, but some of those don't. And so that's, that's kind of what they mean by the differential encoding. So we're only, as long as that connection has been established, we're only transmitting the differences. So that reduces a lot of, a lot of bandwidth as well. So here is, uh, so I kind of put this, so I said there were 61 entries in the static table. I kind of put this underneath. I'm not exactly sure if that's the way it actually works. Uh, so that might, that might be a separate table. Uh, from what I've seen in like Nginx debugging output, there are like different sizes to that table that you can tune it. This, this like stat, this uh, dynamic table that gets, a, that gets you know, populated as your connection gets reused. Um, but it looks something like that, and then you would just be passing these integers around instead of passing around all this information. Uh, the next one here, this is another table that exists in RFC. Um, this was, to me, it was like particularly interesting that they went this hard to, uh, to optimize things. Um, this is a table of Huffman encoding. Uh, Huffman codes for, uh, for various characters. So again, this is like they said that they've done a bunch of analysis on a bunch of traffic. And so they generated Huffman codes for various characters, symbols, um, and they use these Huffman codes during transmission uh, instead of the raw characters. So quickly uh, to, to try to explain Huffman encoding is basically, uh, so if you had like a body of text you would generate like a, like do frequency analysis on individual characters. And so say you would have a table that has like, you know, the letter A and it occurred 56 times and then down at the bottom you'd have like letter Z occurred like six times. So after you assemble that table, then you basically build a tree where the bottom of the tree are things that, uh, don't, occur, um, that don't occur very much and the top of the tree are things that occur frequently. And then as you traverse the tree, every hop on the tree generates uh, this Huffman code. So if you go in one direction, it's a zero. If you go in the other direction, it's a one. So the longer a Huffman code is, the less frequent it exists in the body of text that's been analyzed. Uh, for Huffman codes that are shorter, the, you know, that means that it occurred a lot. And so the attempt there is to basically do some kind of compression where things that occur a lot, we're going to try to reduce the amount of uh, you know, the binary overhead, and then we're going to uh, transmit that instead of the, the actual value. So. Here we just have like that logo.png, we have slash L O G O is already there, PNG is already there. And so the Huffman codes, we can see that the O has the smallest uh, length in bits. And so we can kind of deduce that of all these characters, O is the most, is one that occurs frequently in whatever body of text they use to gen generate this table. And so here we can kind of just see some of the math. So logo.png is nine characters. If we use eight bits for every character in that, it's going to take 72 bits to transmit that, that string over the wire. But if we Huffman encode it using the specific uh, table that's provided in RFC, it's only 46 bits. And so this gets used uh, only in these scenarios where we're passing something that's not indexed. So like the crazy optimization of applying Huffman codes is only getting applied in this subset of, of, of headers that get passed through. But adding all those things together is, is you know, the meat of HPAC. And so the big takeaway there is that uh, a lot of emphasis in compressing headers because they, uh, they repeat a lot. They repeat, like, you know, if you have a web page that pulls, it's going to be pulling all the time, and a lot of those headers are going to be exactly the same. And so if we can try to minimize the amount of traffic that gets generated by headers, then we can reduce the overall footprint. Uh, the next thing here is multiplexing. Uh, I'm not going to spend as much time as I did with HPAC because it's much less complicated, but this is like, this is the biggest thing in HTTP2. This is the biggest reason why, uh, you know, why it's something that we should care about. And multiplexing is basically just the idea of sending multiple HTTP requests over one connection. Uh, so before, you know, we're, we're opening multiple connections for all these various resources. Now we're just trying to open one and issue all of our requests over it. Similar to pipelining, but we'll see in so, uh, a bunch of reasons why it's different. So here's a quick diagram that tries to illustrate that. We have client server. Uh, each one of these individual boxes is referred to as a frame. Uh, 
frames are binary data. So this is another reason why HTTP is better than HTTP2, or at least the more uh, concise over the wire. We're transmitting binary data. We're not transmitting like raw text, like large H, uh, XML payloads or large JSON payloads. Uh, we're transmitting binary data. So we have, uh, we have frames. Uh, a stream is, is a sequence of frames. Uh, generally, a stream uh, can be uh, you know, connected directly to an HTTP request. So if you have five HTTP requests, you probably have like five streams going over your uh, HTTP2 connection. Uh, you can see that these streams or these frames that are part of stream number two, uh, there's like headers and data. These are different uh, frame types. There are a bunch of other ones. These are the, you know, the main ones. And they roughly map to exactly what you would think they map to. Like the headers frame only has headers information. Data frame has the payload for your HTTP request. Uh, you can kind of see, even though the other ones are grayed out, that they're interleaving. We have stream one data. We have stream two headers, stream two data, stream one data. So the streams can interleave. Uh, the one thing that uh, an RFC reference that can happen is you can't have a data frame before a headers frame for the same stream. So headers always have to come before data, but uh, across streams, things can interleave. And then the last thing here is just a connection. So we have one connection. Uh, and we're issuing multiple HTTP requests over that one connection. Um, and I guess the, you know, the takeaway here is that reusing one connection allows HTTP2 to jive with TCP much better. We have to do a lot of work to open up a TCP connection, encrypted TCP connection, and so reusing that for multiple requests is very beneficial. Uh, the last thing here is, uh, is a feature called server push. This is probably one of the most controversial features in HTTP2. There's a lot of controversy in general around HTTP2. It's not like everyone thinks this is like awesome and we should just all do it. There's a lot of controversy. Uh, there's a lot of people that think it's a bad idea. There's people, um, if, you, if you Google for, I think, like uh, the guy that created, um, not the squid prox, oh, Varnish. He has like, you know, a very popular like rebuttal against why he thinks HTTP2 is not that good. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the reasons why people don't think it's that good is people see like, you went from one to two, you did a major reversion, uh, you, you increased the, uh, the major version of the thing, but you really didn't break a lot of backwards compatibility. In fact, you went out of your way to not break it, uh, backwards compatibility. Things like HTTP status codes, the paths, the methods, all those things still work. So all of our code doesn't really have to change that much. The thing that changes a lot is the transport, the way that that data gets transmitted. There's a lot of criticism that you, know, you didn't do enough uh, you should have gotten you should have gotten rid of cookies. You should have added uh, you know explicit layer for authentication, something that people could actually use. So there's a lot of criticism. Uh, so you should definitely look at that kind of stuff before you like decide to roll this out in production tomorrow. Um, but server push is specific to HTTP2, and it's one of the most controversial features because I think it's one that people don't understand how it's going to get used uh, very well. And the idea there is just like preemptively sending data from the server to the client before the client asks for it. So a quick illustration is basically the same as before. You know, you ask for index.html. Somehow the server knows, hey, they're asking index.html. So they're obviously going to need main.css and logo.png. So I should just send that right away. <coughs> uh, there are some problems with this, this type of thing. First, like, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that probably has to go into this backend to know that those assets are required. There's also the problem that Maybe this client's already been to this page, and maybe it already has main.css and logo.png cached, and so now you're sending me data that I already have cached. So like you're you're wasting you're wasting uh, bits on the wire there. Um, so there's a, a lot of proposals, like ideas around like maintaining a cache manifest on the client that gets shipped to the server, so that you can you can say to the server like, hey, don't bother sending me main.css or logo.png. I already have that. Uh, that starts, you know, making things pretty complicated, and so, and also a lot of that stuff hasn't been ironed out fully. So, this hasn't been fully implemented. Uh, like I've used uh, HTTP/2 on nginx. Uh, I hadn't, I hadn't seen any like hooks for making this happen. I don't know if this is something that'll probably exist in like the application uh, server frameworks or whatever. Um, I think I've seen it like potentially implemented in something around WordPress, or like WordPress would try to send you things via a link header. So like things that were attached via a link header would get pushed to you on demand. Um, 
But I really haven't seen this, this used very much, so I don't really know what its fate's going to be. Uh, as far as you know, how this becomes real, uh, Apache 2.4.17 and above have HTTP2 support. It's pretty easy to turn on. Nginx from 1.9.5, uh, I think the stable release is already at 1.10, so it's been there uh, for a little while now. Uh, it's pretty easy to turn on. Usually it's just a directive inside like one of your virtual hosts. You just say uh, HTTP2 basically or something equivalent to that. The, the big thing that, um, that needs to be there is uh, you basically need to have a secure connection. And so uh, the, the, the people that created the HTTP2 specification were originally kicking the idea around of requiring TLS, like basically making that part of the protocol and they eventually backed off it, like saying, like, we don't want to be the people that, like, force this upon everyone else. Uh, but then a good thing that happened is that people implementing HTTP2 basically said, like, fine, then we'll do that. And so uh, things like Chrome uh, you know, won't function over an unencrypted HTTP2 connection. Or, um, and so, so you need to have a certificate of some kind uh, configured for the endpoint that you want to HTTP2 enable. And so here I just reference Let's Encrypt. If you're not familiar, it's basically a CA. They, you, you can get free certificates with like a command line tool. It's like API based, no money. Uh, you can automate it. You can automate renewals for it. Uh, it's a really, really awesome tool. Um, and they're valid certificates. They're not fake certificates. Like they, they work in all the browsers. Uh, CertBot is, uh, is a tool by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, the EFF, uh, they're really big into privacy and security. They build a tool called CertBot that basically uh, tries to wrap uh, Let's Encrypt. So it's just another command line tool that lets you, lets you get those certificates. Um, so as long as you have a certificate configured on your server, turn on HTTP2 support, um, you should be able to use it. Um, and that's pretty much it. So I had a question about the indexing that you talked about earlier, um, where there's that uh, 0 to 61 um, index table. So you mentioned the stuff that's not in that table also gets indexed as well, right? Yeah. Um, and you mentioned in the Huffman um, encoding, uh, that's for data that hasn't been indexed. Is that correct? For the, for the transmission of the data that hasn't been indexed. OK. So like the first time that you see a value that hasn't been put into this table, like the first time you see jobs.xavi.com with the host header, yes, that's going to get Huffman encoded. And okay. then after that, then you're just going to use the index from that OK. Point. That answers my question. One thing that's interesting, uh, so like if you set up Nginx with HTTP2, like I'm more familiar with Nginx than, than Apache. Uh, if you enable its debug mode, um, well, if you compile Nginx with debug support, which if you use the Docker container, they have a neat trick where the, uh, the entry point for the container is like the Nginx binary, but they've also compiled it with, with debug support. And what that does is spits out another binary called Nginx-debug. If you just change the entry point to the container to nginx-debug, it basically turns on all the levels of debugging. And so if you set up HTTP2 uh, enabled nginx and you watch the logs, you can see a lot of this stuff happening. You can see, you can see it maintaining uh, a dynamic table. You're not going to see like all the entries, but you can see like how many entries there are. It's for this particular connection. Uh, you can see references to like these integers being used uh, in, in the stuff that's going back and forth. So you can see a lot of this stuff play out if you enable all this debugging support and just like watch the logs for a while. So what you talked about is that HTTP 2.0. And so is point 0.1, 2.1 like coming soon or is, has there been talks or is there a timeline? Do we, do we kind of understand? Yeah, I don't know anything about is. anything beyond two. Um, I mean, there's a working group that works on that stuff, so I'm sure that they've, they've like, you know, stuff that they wanted to be into, and they've kind of pushed it off to the next version. Um, they are, 
it, they, they do seem to be always referring to it as, as HTTP2 or HTTP slash 2. There's no like 2.0 or 2.1. Uh, another thing that's important to note is that, um, so like if you open up your Chrome inspector, uh, there'll be a column for, you know, what version of HTTP2 is being used. And if you go to like pretty much any Google website or like Twitter, probably Facebook, uh, they're already using HTTP2. And then in that column, you'll see just H2. So where previously you would have seen like HTTP slash 1.1, now you'll just see H2. And H2 refers to uh, the implementation of HTTP2 over a TLS connection. If, uh, if you see HTTP2C, that's the one that goes over plain text, which I'm not sure if you can even get it to, to if you can ever you know, see that in your inspector because Chrome will just like reject the connection. It won't, it won't let it happen. Um, but if you see H2, that's referring to HTTP2. Um, if I remember correctly, there was a technical reason that the server push wasn't capable. It, it didn't exist in HTTP 1. Uh, technical reason why? Um, I'm not sure. I might be thinking about TCP versus web versus streams, or I'm not really sure what I'm talking about, but if uh, that rings a bell. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, something that's slightly related to that. Uh, is is like the the idea of web sockets so like yeah that's it web sockets with like you know the ability for the server to push messages to the client which is own protocol usually runs as a separate service uh, usually requires like s different load balancing configurations different uh, lots of things that are differences which make running that alongside uh, an HTTP server pretty challenging because they're very different um, there are people that you know kind of speculate that maybe HTTP two could just replace web sockets altogether. I haven't really seen any examples of that in practice. It seems like it's potentially feasible because you have things like server push, you have this connection that exists. There's no reason why you could not just send, you know, messages that are encoded differently uh, over that transport layer uh, to the front end. Um, you probably have to have like things on the front end, like libraries that are ready for those payloads and to be able to do things based on them. Um, but there's a lot of you know a lot of people speculate that that might be able to get rid of WebSockets and then we'll just do everything over uh, over an HTTP2 connection. Uh, I was curious if you had done any study or analysis on uh, any kind of hard numbers on the improvements you've seen in certain situations with two versus one. Yeah, uh, the, the, the biggest example that I've seen that actually has data is uh, on the Dropbox uh, blog, on their engineering blog. They have a bunch of graphs, uh, a bunch of examples of like, they initially turned it on and they encountered this bug in Nginx that made, you know, made certain requests uh, be expensive. I think it was like a specific type of post request. But overall, like, you know, the amount of traffic that gets transmitted has gone down. Their performance is like being better on the same infrastructure. That's probably the best example of somebody doing this for real in production, not just like me at home trying to like run this. Um, this website, which doesn't exist here, let's see. Um, so this is this is a website that was created by the people, I guess, that like wrote the HTTP2 library support into the Go programming language. Um, and so they basically created this website to, well, there, this website is just one of the sites under this, like if you go back here, there's a couple of other examples. This is one of the ones that I think is the most dramatic, I guess. Um, but they kind of built this to illustrate the differences between these things. And so here we have, so this is a tiled image. This is HTTP1 with an injected 200 millisecond latency. So when we click on that, we see like, we can see that 200 millisecond latency, each one of those tiles is different HTTP request. It's taken a long time. It took, you know, whatever, like seven and a half seconds for that page to load. And then here is the same 100 millisecond uh, injected latency, but over HTTP2. And so that, that's really dramatic. That's, you know, mostly because they're using one origin. And so they're uh, in, in, the, in this other case, we're, we're experiencing that, uh, that thing where it's like six, wait, six, wait, six, wait. Uh, 
so that's what makes that more dramatic in, in, in practice. Like, you know, mapping, mapping providers like Google Maps and stuff, like they're not going to do this. That would be dumb. They're going to have like a bunch of different domains. They have a bunch of different advanced protocols that are like beyond, like Google's experimenting with this other protocol called Quick, which is like over UDP, which is something that's beyond like what most people can, can kind of focus on day-to-day -day basis because we have bigger problems or bigger problems for us. Um, so that's what kind of makes that be more dramatic, but you can see how that you know, could come into play when you have a lot of different assets on your page. Uh, if they're all happening over that connection and they're all you know, multiplexed, that can happen really quickly versus waiting for these connections to kind of uh, go back and forth. Hey, so um, once you're on HTTP2, is there any reason to continue minifying, concatenating um, JavaScript or other resources if you're trying to squeeze those last couple bytes down for mobile or something? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it wouldn't hurt because ultimately you would just be transmitting less, less data. Um, but I feel like there's probably like there's some some degree of like diminishing returns there where like that that like doing the like having that static build pipeline in our apps now although painful is extremely useful because we could have like i don't know five megabytes of vendor javascript that gets reduced down to like a couple k and that's a pretty big difference on on pretty much everything like even even a good internet connection um, but i feel like once once the the payloads of these requests is binary uh, you know, removing all the headers that are happening over these multiple things, um, it'll it'll take some analysis. Like it'll take some good data to like identify like, can we just get away with just doing this and, and, and reverting back to like not worrying about this stuff, or do we need to do both? Uh, or if we do do both, what's what's the payoff like relative to how much effort it takes? So it'll be interesting to see as people you know post blog posts about how they're doing this stuff in production. I think a lot of the Dropbox stuff was just like. API calls and stuff, so there's not there's not a ton of like static asset overhead. It's mostly just payloads going back and forth. And that was kind of my second question: is a lot of these examples that I see on HTTP two is uh, are around your your standard website, a web page. Are there ways for an API to really kind of take advantage of some of the new things that are coming along with HTTP two? I mean, obviously the headers being smaller benefits everything. But um, multiplexing and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think the so uh, a lot of times, like people like to talk about microservices and like all this kind of like I think kind of like useless complexity on top of like our already hard jobs. But uh, in those examples, uh, you know, when you're doing that kind of stuff, a lot of times there's a discussion like, should I just create an HTTP API and all of my microservices are going to talk using that? or that's gonna to be too much overhead. Maybe I need to like get really smart and use like something that's binary encoded. Maybe I need to use like thrift or protobuf um, for those messages. And then you, know, you, get, you get to some, some additional complexity there. And I think that just adopting HTTP2, if you already have an HTTP1 API, uh, is pretty useful because now your payloads are binary. And so a lot of the reasons why you would use one of those different tools I mean, those tools are still super useful. Like they'll have like schema evolution. They'll have specific types that you can, you know, serialize and deserialize efficiently. So, that, not to say that you should not use those tools, but uh, a big benefit of you know a big reason why people want to use those tools is because now I don't have to transmit large XML blobs or whatever. I'm just transmitting binary data. So that can definitely help in a lot of cases. All the stuff with like header header stuff, the uh, the, the multiplexing can be really useful. And you know, in most cases, like things like Nginx and Apache will have HTTP2 support. Most likely, your application server will not. So we use Python a lot. We use GUnicorn a lot. Uh, doesn't have HTTP2 support. But even just putting a layer of HTTP2 between users and our application has a pretty big difference. Like it's going to make a pretty big difference because all of those requests coming from multiple users or coming from the load balancer can now be HTTP2 uh, connections, like long-lived connections. And then it's just going to be able to do, make more requests. So you might have to like increase the number of workers on the back end to satisfy you know, that, that, that amount of demand or play some other tricks, um, or maybe to the point where they eventually implement that stuff in those back ends, and then we just have HTTP2 all the way through. 
Um, I, do th I do feel like it's going to change some of the ways that we make decisions because I feel like, um, like a lot of times people will just configure load balancers to be really dumb and just round robin, which you can still do, but now you're going to have like longer connections. And so now you probably want to use an algorithm that just is based on least number of connections. So you don't saturate a particular you know, backend server with too many connections that users are not letting go of because they're doing a lot of stuff. Uh, so I feel like stuff like that is going to become a problem. We're going to have to figure out ways to like, you know, uh, get a better understanding of how much uh, how much of a resource overhead a connection actually is on our backends. Like how much memory is each connection taking? Uh, how much CPU is each connection taking? Which now I think we just kind of don't worry about because connection happens, it dies, next one. Um, but yeah, it'll it'll be interesting when when people start putting out you know the results of you know, gathering all their metrics and how this stuff is, has gotten better or worse. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys.